He is Howard Ibach, the author of two books on the creative brief and a former creative director. And he's Mark Jensen, a lecturer at the University of Minnesota's Hubbard School of Journalism and Mass Communications. Together, we're the Brief Brothers. We love talking about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. Mark is our special guest host today because Henry is out of town. We are doing part two of our conversation with Ernie Schenk. Why don't we continue our conversation? I know this is probably something that was in one of your columns, and I'm going to quote <clears> your <throat> book here now, so it's not your column. Mm -hmm. The part I've de part I've defaced again. I apologize, <laughs> um, but and maybe this will be a segue into the discussion about the brief. Um, you were talking about the single-minded proposition here, and you were quoting Stavros Kosmopoulos, and I wrote about mm -hmm. him a couple of weeks ago in my own blog. I took one of his workshops in the '90s, a thousand years ago for most people, right? Yeah, and he brought with him that block of wood with mm -hmm. the single nail. And I, yeah. I think he had, I think he had a piece of vellum. I forget what the material was that he had stretched over the blocks of wood. And there was like 50 nails in this and then he pulled it apart and there was a single nail. So the 50 nails would not penetrate the vellum that was stretched taut. But when he pulled out the single nail and then shoved it through, it absolutely penetrated and made oh, his yeah. point about one, I do a version of that in my workshop training, but I don't use the nail. I, I wanted to put together one of those things, but I'm not handy enough to, to build the wood and put the nails together. So I found a half a dozen magic markers. I would call on a victim, I mean, a volunteer to come out in front of the group. And I would be talking to the group and then I toss the magic markers at the person without warning. And she usually he or she couldn't even catch one. Right. Maybe they would catch one. But that was the point. It served as my block of wood. So, yep. have you? Have you? Uh, did you? Did you know stuff? I mean, I'm like, I met him at this workshop. He's an amazing creative talent. Yeah. Did you ever have a chance to work with him in your career? No, I came along later uh, after he was gone. Uh, unfortunately, because he, he always sounded to me like a a cool guy um old school old school i you know i i now that you talk about the nail thing which was one of the great graphic things of all time um no. i used to do a thing like that i did a class at uri a couple of time, a couple of years actually and uh i, I when i i can remember the opening night of the class uh yeah, I knew that I wanted to make the point that in advertising, you have to, you have to, uh, it's kind of like the nail in a way, you you have to, have, you have to make a point quickly and fast, and you've got to create a, a sense of mystery. So what I did, I, I came into the class, and I went up to the lectern there and everything, and I had my bag and I was taking out notes and stuff and that I was going to look at, you know, use in the class. And the last thing I removed was a German Luger. And I put the Luger down on, on the lectern. See, I see, I see the look in your face right there, right, right yeah. there. That's got my the, attention. a Luger. No, <laughs> uh, it got your attention. That's exactly it. And I, and you, his, you couldn't do that today, Ernie. You'd be arrested. No. Oh, oh my just God. Work. Oh my God! In those days, it wasn't real. It was it was like a very real looking German Luger was steel and everything, but it was it was not a real gun. Okay. And so that I, still would get you in trouble. <laughs> oh yeah, it definitely would. But uh, it makes for a good story. And uh, but um, yeah, you know, I so I took the gun and I put it down on top and I started to talk about the class. I never said anything about the gun till halfway through the class until the and these kids are like. What the fuck? You're gonna, you're gonna like, <laughs> what's going on? And one, and one kid finally was brave enough to say, "Excuse me, Mr. Shank, what's what's with the gun?" I said, "It makes it's it's what I've been trying to tell you guys for the last half hour here. You got to get people's attention. Did I get your attention? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you definitely got my attention. Okay. So anyway." Um, it was fun. 
Yeah, well, you know, let's use that as an opportunity to jump into to create a brief. We do, you know, we call ourselves the Brief Brothers. Yes. And Mark Mark recruits me once a semester to come and talk about briefs and answer his students' questions. Um, yeah. You talk about, I know, I went right, when I got your, grabbed your book, I went right to your parent, your chapters on the brief. And I hadn't thought about that Stavros Cosmopolis exercise in years. And I'm, you know, I'm going to bring mm -hmm. it back. Um, is it still a valuable document today? Are you lamenting it as much as I do when I encounter people out there who are seeking to know how to use it better? What are your thoughts about the brief today? Yeah. Well, of course, the brief is still relevant because, uh, I mean, we have, I mean, you, I don't think it, well, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think it helps a lot when you've got a great planner who is able to write a brief that uh, works for the, for, for me as a creator. I think the problem is that so many of them, and this has always been the case I have found, but it still is, so many briefs are flawed. And, and, and then the way that is, I think because they fail to ignite a spark with creatives. And to me, that's what a brief is supposed to be doing. It's supposed, I'm supposed to look at it, by the way, it should be no longer than a page in my, mm -hmm. in my mind. I, you know, I, I worked with an agency um, in Paris for the last uh, two years. And my, my God, their briefs are like 12 pages long, 16 pages. I mean, come on, God. Anyway, um, so what too. is, yeah, I'm sure you have. And, and it, but to me, uh, so many briefs get mired down in intellectual information and not enough, if any, in what I, I call emotional magic. Okay. I, I, I think I'm looking for, and I, I don't see it very much, but I'm looking, I'm always looking for emotional magic in a brief. I want to see, see something on that page, that short page, that it just, it, it, you know, ignites my imagination. I read that one line of copy and I say, holy, wow, I can do something with this. This is amazing. I haven't even started working yet and I already know where I'm going. And so, uh, so what do you think is, is the remedy or are, are there remedies to acquiring or achieving that emotional magic, which a definition I love, by the way. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you know, I think too many planners are, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I think a lot of planners that I've seen, um, you know, to justify what they do, they take a long time to work on it. There's all this, of course, there's a lot of research findings to write about and data points, and they've got to talk about demographics and psychographics and that's i'm not saying all of that is not an is not required but it i think what happens is you don't have a you don't have many planners that really understand the creative gestalt mm -hmm. they don't understand how the creative act works and uh they were you don't ever invited were you ever invited by a planner to sit down and have a conversation and contribute to his brief or his or her brief to collaborate no, I, with the planner? No, that's never been asked of me. Um, I, and I've never asked it of them. Um, but uh, I, I tell you what has happened is that uh, I feel that if I get a brief that's leaving me nowhere, I'm just cold. I, I can't get excited about it. Then I, if I have to, I will take a crack at it myself. Not the whole thing, but I will kind of look for you know, a lot of times you'll you'll find these little nuggets that are hidden within the brief, and the the, the planner didn't mean it to be a nugget, but it's a nugget that is just the accidental creative nugget, right? And you kind of see it. I mean, that is for a creative, an ability worth nurturing, uh, to to be able to see again. It's like the hummingbird, right? It's be it's be, be being able to look at a brief. And and say okay the, the, yeah 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 that 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 the, yeah okay whatever oh wait a minute what's what what's this this is interesting I could do something with this and then turn that into a line and in, in, in that belongs in the brief bring it out into the light it's kind of wallowing down there in the depths of the abyss take it out of the abyss 
Not that the plan I meant for it to be down there in the Marianas trench, but you know, there it is and lift it up and bring it up to the daylight and let it shine. And, 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 and suddenly, you know, a lot, a lot of times there is emotional magic in a brief, but nobody knows it because it's so goddamn hidden. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think what would help is if we had more planners who really understood how the creative act works. And because if they understand that they'll be working toward that. Um, See, that's why I, I, my, when I do the trainings, I preach collaboration. I think creators, mm -hmm. because we have skin and I'm a former creative, I'm a copywriter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not, not quite at your level, but I was a copywriter for many years. I think we, because we have skin in the game, we should be involved. If you're going to show me the brief at the kickoff, it's too late. Right. I want to see a draft of the brief and, you know, Henry, my partner here. And I think, uh, Mark would agree with this, that when you show the brief in a rough draft to at least the creative director, you're going to get some feedback that maybe the planner hadn't thought about before. Those yeah. nuggets that you discovered, are, yeah, that's an opportunity for the creative to point out and say, hey, what about this? Where's this going to go? What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. I, uh, Howard, I just add to that. I, I think that's so important to that whole point of collaboration. Certainly in my professional career, I would do that a lot. My last creative uh, director, Chris Preston, uh, we just always would collaborate on things. Um, if I could ask one question, Ernie, because I really love mm. when you talked about nuggets and emotional magic, where on the brief can they come from? Can they come from anywhere? Is it only in the SMP or do you find that other places in a brief? Well, like I said, I mean, I, I, I think of, Quite often they're hidden, uh, unintentionally, obviously, but I think they're not always in the uh, um, they're all they're not always in the obvious spots. Um, so uh, they can't, you know, it it can be anywhere, but uh, but 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 I think somebody has to be able to go through it with a, a comb that allows you to weed out all the all you know all the chaff. Again, I, no disrespect to planners who work so hard at assembling all this information, but it's not what it's not what fuels me. What I need is that golden nugget, that kind of visionary line that that says. I mean, I mean, if you look at, um, and I think you probably did this, and aren't you doing a collection of classic briefs from? Various agencies. Yeah, I'm. I am. I'm assembling. It's a called the Creative Brief Archive, and I am. Yeah. Recruiting planners and and creatives and anyone who happens to have copies to send me briefs. Yeah. I, yeah. I I can't be at this point. I I am not being um, selective in the sense that I'm judging them. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna present right. them like a librarian right. would present yep. them, and some will be really really good, and and some will not be quite as good. But that will also give I think readers and viewers an opportunity to do a compare and contrast but yes i am doing that i i think that i think you did one on the milk stuff it didn't you do one on on the on the gut milk a campaign I aaron don't burr have, i don't have that i don't have that okay um, brief. okay i'd love to get that brief do you do you have it by any chance no no <laughs> but that's the but the, i but but i can visualize it in my head well, see, I no, can, that's I, the thing. We can we can reverse engineer it, you're right? But I but but I don't want to do that because right. I, I right. first of all I'm a creative, although I mean you're not the only creative that I've heard to redo a brief that you didn't like or didn't quite get. Cameron Day has talked about doing that. He calls them his mantras, and Cam has sent me one of his mantras that I'm going to include in the archive. So creatives do that as an exercise, but reverse engineering still is an educated guess, but it's still a guess because there's information right. that we don't have, we're not privy to. And I don't want to right. do that. Right, right. I don't blame you. Um, and I also believe I that great creative telegraphs the brief. Yeah. Even a, even a non-professional, if we were to go out in the street and Joe or Jane consumer and ask the, the questions in the right way, they would tell us what the brief was without knowing that they'd done it. 
A yes. creative would do it quick, you know, instantly. So, yeah, the, the right. single idea is this, and the insight is probably that. And you know, I think I know who they're talking to. They're not talking to this, but 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 it's great creative will telegraph that. Lousy creative, and there's more of it out there, will just befuddle us. That's as right. My, as my sister would say, befuddle with two T's. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> so again, I want to ask what I want to put you against the wall here a little bit, Ernie. I'm going to put you on the spot. What are some remedies? Again, I'm not asking you to do a how-to, but what do you think brief writers could do to improve the quality of their brief writing? Well, again, I don't know how you would do it, um, but br brief writers, planners, whoever, uh, have got to find a way to get in the head of a creative uh and i and I, and you know i mean look at look i mean they would be well advised to look at a lot of great look this is how i they didn't have ad schools when i started out in the business right what i did was once i decided that that this is what i want to do what i did is i got hold of every awards annual i could get my hands on with the one show the ca andy awards lurtz's archives and I would just pour through these books and look at great work. And I believe a lot in osmosis, in the idea of osmosis, um, that you look through this work and you, if, you, if you look at it enough, you begin to see a pattern, uh, not a formula, but a pattern to the work that most of the award-winning stuff seems to share. And and then through osmosis, you kind of ingest that into your own consciousness, and you 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 kind of start to get a feel for that, and you and you start to do that in your own stuff, and that's how I kind of learned it. And I think maybe the same with planners. Like, if you want to get inside of the head of great creatives, you know, great creatives and great creative work, maybe you should do that too. You can kind of, you know, get out a bunch of award and you know annuals. Turn yourself into a creative for a while, and and kind of uh, you know kind of immerse yourself in that in that world, and hopefully through the process of osmosis, um, you know you'll you'll you, you know you'll start to get a feeling for uh, how they think, and and you will come to realize that um, what they're looking for. Uh, is not demographics or psychographics. I realize the importance of that now, many years later. But I got to be honest with you, for years, I thought, I don't, I don't care. I don't care about who's reading the goddamn. It doesn't matter to me. It's going to be a great idea and it will work for anybody. I don't care if they're 12 years old or 100. It, it's, it's a blanket concept. If it's a gr great idea, it's a great idea for everybody. Now, I know that's not the case anymore, but that's what I believed at the time. So I pay. I place a great premium on a powerful insight that you looked at it, and and just looking at that at that line, that one line, took you back to all those awards annuals, and you saw something in that line that reminded you of all that work, and you just say, "Wow, this is this is great." So I don't know how you reprogram a planner's mind, but I think that would be one suggestion is, is to, is to immerse yourself in creative stuff and pretend that that's you. And in a way it is you because I, I I'm one of those who happen to believe that, that everybody is creative and I don't care what your background is. You know, you used to be, when you were a kid, you were wildly creative, weren't you? Well, that's well, well, well that stuff is still there. It's just been hidden under whatever you've, you know, whatever you've been doing for these last 20, 25 years or whatever. Um, yeah. So access that and maybe it helps, you know. I, I think in many ways you have uh, in your own unique way, Ernie, endorsed a kind of collaboration. If you want the creatives to get involved in the brief writing, the brief writer has to walk. You know, I like to say you can't sell something to someone if you don't sympathize with them. Right. You have to walk a mile in their shoes. So the brief yes. writer has to walk in a mile, a mile in the shoes of the creative to help get that, find that nugget. How interesting that, it might be. Yeah, yeah. Interesting that you that you mentioned that. Uh, I I've always thought that um in terms of being a creative, uh, you're never gonna realize 
how good you can be as a creative if you don't have a great deal of empathy. Uh, you have to have a, a tremendous amount of empathy. Uh, you have to you have to understand how people not just how they think about a product, but how they feel about it, how they feel about it in their life, and how it will integrate into their world. If you don't have empathy, if you're not an empath, I I I really feel the best creatives are empaths. They just have a, a, a they just have a, a native um, way of being able to relate with how their audience feels about things, and it's usually a far cry from. Uh, so I that's interesting you that you mentioned that because what we're talking about here, if you match them up, there has to be an empathy between creative and planner. Mm -hmm. And I, as a creative, have have to be empathetic with the planner and what they're trying to achieve, trying to get to, and they have to be have to have an empathy up toward me and what I'm looking for and what I have to have, or I can't do my best stuff. Yeah, uh, I like to quote Henry. I, I mean, I've, we've been doing this podcast now for two years, and he is a a planner. He's a strategist, a working strategist. Yeah. And I have learned so much from talking to Henry. I've told uh, Mark this. I've told his students this. And one of the things that he says when he sits, sits down to write a brief, especially when it comes to answering the question, who are we talking to? Who is our customer? He says, I like to write that description in such a way that the creatives can put it on as a costume and see the customer through the eyes of what I've written. So, yeah, that's wow, great. That's, that's, yeah, that's really powerful. So I want to ask you, I can you can almost guess this question. Do <laughs> our do creatives today have enough empathy? Are we lacking or in that in that uh, emotion? I, I think we're if if you look at it next to the kind of work that was being done at an earlier time, yeah, I think we are lacking in empathy as a as you know as a profession, as creatives anyway. And I, I would say to you that not all of it is our fault because again, this business has been turned inside out. And it's, I think to, to be truly empathetic, you have to have the ability to trust your gut instinct. You, it's, it's not a science. I'm sorry to say, I mean, we, we've tried to make it into a science and we have, yeah. and it is, yeah. you know, uh, but, but I think to, 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 to be able to be, to have the kind of empathy I'm talking about, to be able to do the kind of work that we all knew from another time, and to just, and also now, um, but uh, if, in order to be able to do that, I, I think you have to feel like you're not under the scrutiny of algorithms and 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 you know all this stuff, all this digital uh, quagmire. I, I I'm calling it the way I see it, um, but uh, you know it doesn't allow a lot of a lot of room for 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 empathy to be nurtured um as i guess is what i'm saying so yeah mark you want to yeah monopolize in this conversation no no it's great conversation i think just to maybe follow up on the empathy thing ernie given that so many agencies are working in a hybrid environment or um, I know even Carmichael Lynch here in town, it is a work from anywhere philosophy where people don't have to come into work. How has that impacted the creative process uh, when people are not in the same room? Great question. It is a great question. And I will tell you that I, I see it every day. It depends on who you ask, right? I mean, a lot of, a lot of people think we lost so much when we had to be do what we're doing here. We're doing Zoom calls all the time, and we're not in the same room, and uh, so we're not able to 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 share each other, uh, eyeball to eyeball, and, and, and you know we're not doing our best work because it's hard to collaborate with anybody when they're on a screen. I do not share that viewpoint. I I think like all this. All this stuff we've heard about for years, and I'm not saying it's invalid, but the thing about happy accidents of running into a guy in the hall and say, hey, did you see that thing? Yeah, I saw that last night. That was a cool thing. I wonder if there's an idea in it. Okay, I can tell you that I've, been, I've done a lot of stuff during the pandemic. I've done a lot of creative work and collaborated with a lot of people just like we're doing now, like the guys in Paris. Uh, you know, we worked on Rolex. For a couple of years, I think we did some some great stuff. 
uh, that, that uh, you know, and it was all like this. And I didn't go to Paris. I've never been to Paris. I don't know that I want to go to Paris. But I mean, so all I can say is talking for myself, it has not been a hindrance. I don't, you know, some people, it's a problem because those people tend to be, maybe they're extroverts and they just like human contact. And and I'm perfectly happy to be up here in my tree house looking out at the trees and the ocean beyond. And I'm fine with that. It, it, it absolutely helps me. So, um, so I don't think we've lost, maybe we have, but if we've lost anything, it's because uh, we just haven't adapted as well. I mean, I didn't have to adapt when all the, all the uh, lockdowns happened and everything. I was already used to that because I was, uh, I was, I've been freelancing forever. I, I agree with you completely, Ernie, but I think we, we as, as two creatives and Mark as, a, as an account person and, and as a teacher, have fine-tuned and honed our muscles to the point where we know how to collaborate. Whereas if you're a junior, whatever it is, a junior account yeah, person, a that, junior that's creative, yep. you haven't practiced that. Mm, you know, when, right. when you put a creative team together that's had 10 to 15 years of experience and you put a junior team together, that senior team, even a mid-level team, will crank out ideas in an hour right. at five or 10 times the, the quantity that the junior team was because they know how to do it. They just trust right. their creative muscle. Whether they're suffering from imposter syndrome or not, I, I don't know. I've heard that a lot. But I just think you fine-tune that muscle yeah. and you practice it, you get good at it. And of I think course. that's what you're talking about. So I, I agree with you. I, when the lockdown happened, it's like, yeah, this doesn't change my life. Doesn't. I'm, I'm basically working at home already. I just can't right. go anywhere now. Right. Um, right. But it's a, it's a great question because collaboration is something that you have to practice to get good at. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. That's you know? right. Not, yeah, that, not usually. I agree. I mean, what you're talking about, I think veterans, uh, the seasoned veterans know how to do it. And I teach, Ernie, so I see a lot of young people and a people a year or two out of school, mm -hmm. and it, it's a struggle for them. They, they, a lot of them are want to be in the office more often because they feel they're learning more, uh, having more supervision with creative directors and mm -hmm. getting feedback uh, versus just on a Zoom call where a seasoned yep. person already has been through the wars. Do you have any thoughts on how they could get better at that? Have you thought about anything like that, you know, for young people? It's important. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a very different thing. If I were 25 years old and uh, new to the business and everything, it would be a struggle to try to do this stuff virtually like this, to, you know, to work off campus. Um, so I, I think like, uh, I'm not saying this is a reason why agencies ought to become hybrid, but I think if you are a hybrid agency, you, you can you can allow for them to be in the office. If they want to be there and they want to learn, then they have that in the, you know they have that ability. But I don't think there's a lot. I mean, I don't know if there's a lot of agencies right now that are completely virtual. I mean, it seems like most of them have gone to some sort of hybrid model, one way or the other. Um, but you know it's it's definitely an issue, and I it it it, it speaks to uh, you know when you're that young um, and 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 another thing in your list there that I was kind of interested in was this idea of uh, you know what what does this business really offer millennials, Gen Z? Uh, they're much more critical and much more looking for meaning, uh, and I that never even entered into my mind meaning i didn't you know meaning you know i did i i did some great stuff for you know like uh, like i don't know like abortion rights or you know uh, survivors network of those abused by priests and uh, the things like that but meaning never to me it was all about inventing desire Right. That's what it was about. And I, I found that really fascinating. The whole idea that you can invent desire. They're not they're not they're not fooled by that anymore. It, that means nothing to them. And it doesn't matter that you have a dartboard in the agency or a pool table. They, they, they don't they don't care. I care. But, but they don't. That's 
that's Steve Harrison's book, Can't Sell, Won't Sell. It's, it's the young people today don't want to, they don't feel comfortable or they don't want to sell toothpaste or, or toilet paper or detergent. They want to be involved in these social justice causes. Yeah. And that's, I think it's part of the reason why there is a lack of empathy because the, the folks who mm. are, are responsible for walking the mile in another person's shoes to understand what it is that they need when they go out and buy toilet paper, yeah. they, don't, they don't relate to that. But right. if you want to talk about climate change or environmental issues or voting rights or abortion rights and all these things that you've talked about, yeah. that is what appeals to them. And I, you know, when I talk to Mark's class, one of the first questions I ask is, how comfortable are you with the idea of selling stuff? widgets right right and and sometimes and, and i've seen a variety of answers sometimes people say i don't have a problem with it and then i ask them about their understanding of the concept of capitalism to understand what it is to, to sell stuff and sometimes the classroom is yeah. two or three students are, are 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 only comfortable with doing that and the rest are not and another time i'll teach i'll talk to his class and there are there are more avowed capitalists in the class than in the previous class. So there's a there's a swing back and forth. But I think this notion that you're talking about of being comfortable with that idea of selling and is is absent, is or is yeah. or is diminishing yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah, but for sure. I mean, I think uh, you know, it's one thing if you're working for an agency or or Patagonia, for example, if you're working for Patagonia. Or uh, you, you're working for uh, Bombas, who, you know, you know, you know, they donate one pair of socks to the homeless for every one that you buy, and things and like that. And only the senior, only the senior creatives are going to have the 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 plum assignments on, on counts like that, right? Well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, so it's great if a Patagonia rolls along. I think a lot of a lot of millennials could get behind something like that because it's an authentic brand, and that, and that. That is the problem we have here. We we don't we don't have a lot of brands that we work for, no matter what the agency is or who they are. We don't have a lot of brands that are authentic. In fact, we have the opposite of that. I think we have a case right now of bandwagonitis, where mm. every new little trendy thing, the agency's going to jump on the band. Oh yeah, we do that. Oh yeah, we do that. Oh AI, yeah, we're definitely into AI. We're leading the way on AI. Give me a break. I mean, it's just because you want to be relevant and a, you want to be quickly relevant. And so you jump on the bandwagon and that's not authentic. That's being a phony and that's mm. being an opportunist. And those kids can see right through it. Good stuff, Mark. Good stuff, Howard. He's Mark Jensen. He's Howard Ibach. And together we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye.